today to discuss Sri Lanka. Asanga Abegunu Sekara is the Director General of the newly established Defense Ministry Think Tank, right? Institute for National Security Studies, Sri Lanka. Is that the correct, complete? Yes. So we're grateful also to USI for combining with us to join hands to organize this closed door discussion. Nothing secrets will be discussed, but we just thought in the interest of being frank, let's follow Chatham House rules, just in the interest of being frank, you know. As I said, I will, Asanga will speak for about 25, 30 minutes, 25 minutes, and then we'll have a, we'll go around and take. Hmm? Over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shakti Singha, and, and Director, uh, USI, distinguished scholars, um, it's a great honor. Um, when I saw the audience, I think um, I was kind of stunned. Uh, I believe I was wondering whether the Prime Minister is also coming. So uh, <laughs> such a such a distinguished uh, uh, lot that you have gathered. So it's a great honor and a privilege to present to uh, an audience like this. So my paper. Uh, uh, basically, we'll examine, uh, we'll talk about geopolitics of Indian Ocean and Sri Lanka's relationship, uh, Indo-Sri Lanka relationship. So, um, uh, basically, um, I will give a short abstract and get into the um, sort of uh, two areas which I want to discuss of the Indian Ocean, and then I will discuss of the relationship, the Indo-Sri Lanka relationship. So, um, as you know, the Indian Ocean will be the ocean where the big game will be played in the future. The existing global leader, uh, United States, uh, rising China, and emerging India will be the key global players uh, in the Indian Ocean. We have seen um, to counterbalance a rising power and its dominance of the Indian Ocean, how regional nations will tie with extra-regional nations. Now, Indian Ocean is the only ocean which is named after a state. And the question for some scholars um, is whether Indian Ocean belongs to India. Now, India has a clear role to play in Indian Ocean and also has to know what is going on in the Indian Ocean's backyard. Now, the Chinese uh, submarines incidents in Sri Lanka was a clear indication of this situation, how India reacted. Uh, India's concern was if the visit of the Chinese submarines was a surprise or was it a carefully calibrated decision. Now with this backdrop, to clearly understand the changing geopolitical dynamics of the Indian Ocean, I will discuss two key areas, which is the China's strategic presence in the Indian Ocean and India's strategic aspiration in the Indian Ocean. And finally, we'll discuss the Indo-Sri Lanka relationship. Now, if you look at the China strategic presence, it is clearly for the, uh, the sea lanes of communications uh, that India is, uh, uh, sorry, China is uh, basically focusing on, and China's economy at the level of present growth and the future growth aspiration. For China to be the global manufacturing hub, it will require the tons of hydro, hydrocarbons that is transported across the two choke points, which is Strait of Hormuz and Malacca. And um, Sri Lanka's geostrategic position in this geopolitical tapestry is seen as a significant place of importance. Now, the recent um, the, uh, the Stratford report on Sri Lanka's geostrategic position, you must have seen. And also, uh, Robert Kaplan has clearly mentioned in his book on the geo Sri Lanka as a geostrategic hub. Um, in one of the interviews, I quote Kaplan, I consider... He says, I consider Sri Lanka part of the new geography. It's part of the new maritime geography, and that makes it very important, unquote. He further explains the main sea lines of communication between the Bay of Bengal and the Arabian Sea and between the South China Sea and the Indian Ocean. Uh, it's part of China's plan to construct a string of pearls, ports that they don't own, but which they can use for their warships all across the Indian Ocean, unquote. Now, Hambantota port is the center stage due to the geographical position. And Hambantota port 
was seen at the southern tip of Sri Lanka, which is closer to the busiest shipping lanes of the world, few nautical miles just outside the port. This is seen by some experts as a Chinese uh, strategy for military presence in the Indian Ocean, which China and Sri Lanka denies clearly, says, stating that this is only for economic and trade benefit only. Now, a recent lecture, actually uh, two days ago, Professor Swaran Singh in Colombo, uh, who is also part of our uh, distinguished resource pool at the Institute of National Security Studies, uh, I quote uh, Professor Swaran Singh. He says, Sri Lanka in China's eyes have moved from once being a savior for isolated China to becoming a st uh, staging post for China's strategic game plan. China today values the island's strategic location in the Indian Ocean. He further explains that China's massive investment in the Hambantota port is projected as an economic project, but it makes no economic logic given its zero commercial viability for long time to come. But it makes strategic sense and bringing political influence. So India, on the other hand, enjoys social influence and Sri Lanka civil society has often supported India and shows skepticism towards China." Unquote. At the moment, not many ships visit Hambantota and it's not a busy harbour. As Colombo, uh, as Colombo when you compare, but years to come this position will change. It is a long-term strategic project which Sri Lanka and the region also could benefit economically. Now, Sri Lanka will not allow an extra regional power to build a military outpost in the island due to the strong relationship with its neighboring India. It's also important to consider when examining this point China's geostrategic disadvantages in the Indian Ocean. Now, according to um, Dr. Brewster, he says that China's strategic vulnerability is reinforced by the scarcity of overland trans transport connections between Chinese territory and the Indian Ocean. He further examines that China currently has no ability to exert control over the choke points and nor has it any regular naval presence in any of the ports. Now, some Western analysts debate if China is pursuing bases in Indian Ocean under uh, the Chinese uh, People's Liberation Army would have access to only limited facilities for specific purpose or contingencies. Now, their own scholars, uh, one of the Chinese uh, scholars basically, uh, Professor Sheng Dingli at Fudang University, I quote, it is wrong for us to believe that we have no right to set up bases abroad. He argues it, China needs not only a blue water navy, but also overseas military bases to cut the supply cost. Now this input has to be considered when uh, deciding on long-term strategic decisions by India and also Sri Lanka. Now we will examine the, the India's strategic aspirations. Now this is how uh, we see basically um, the, how India sees the India's strategic aspiration in the ocean. Now some scholars um, at various discussions pose the question if the Indian Ocean belongs to India and New Delhi regards Indian Ocean as India's backyard. Now when looking at uh, Nehru's uh, selected works, uh, one could think if India followed a similar model to Monroy Doctrine which is to e exclude extra-regional powers from the vicinity of India and Indian Ocean. Uh, this has an early place in strategic thinking in modern India's determination to rid the subcontinent of residual colonial influence and exclude other powers from entire South Asian region. Uh, it's further explained that is an underlying theme in Indian strategic thinking that presence of outside powers in India's neighborhood is illegitimate and India's neighbors must rely upon India as a regional manager and security provider according to Babani Sen Gupta. Now, scholars such as uh, Subramaniam, K. Subramaniam has discussed that leadership in the Indian Ocean is part of India's manifest destiny. Sri Lankan scholar Vernon Mendis clearly states, India's role in South Asia, uh, the short-sighted policy 
pursued by successive Indian governments to make India the sole dominant power in South Asia have created suspicions in the minds of small states like Sri Lanka. Now every government has limitations and India has shown its clear limitation in the case of Sri Lanka when dealing with almost 30 years civil war. It was also evident from the Chinese submarine port calls. Now when I inquired this from the Honorable Defense Minister at the Shangri-La Dialogue, which Sakti was also there, um, what if another uh, Chinese submarine arrives in Sri Lanka? The minister answered, saying it will be case by case basis. Now this is a wrong strategy and India and Sri Lanka should have a proactive long-term defense position on such important matters, not a reactive position. On the regional level, India has uh, resisted inviting also Pakistan to join um, the IORA and also or allowing China to become a full member of the IONS. Now India is building its, uh, with all this, India is building a massive uh, 48 warships under construction that is going on and which is we plan to, uh, to expand up to 198 warships by 2027 with nuclear submarines as well as conventional submarines. So this, this, um, uh, this environment is what we are going to live with and Sri Lanka's neighborhood, uh, this is going to happen. And Colombo should be ready to proactively face any future challenges or cooperations um, with India. And as the Indian Ocean security environment is expected to remain very complex. Now, I will move into the India-Sri Lanka relationship now. I'll start with uh, Sh um, Ambassador Shiv Shankar Menon's latest book. The Choices. Now he uh, explains that India had to take a mini-max foreign policy uh, decisions at the last stage of Sri Lankan uh, protracted civil war in 2009. I quote, um, decisions aimed at minimizing the harm and maximizing the gain whether you succeed or no is uh, never apparent. At the moment, no is necessary clear subsequently. He further explains, no matter what one might think of its internal politics, Sri Lanka today is a better place without the LTT and the civil war. And India contributed to making that outcome possible. Ambassador Menon clearly explains the limitations of foreign policy decision made by India towards Sri Lanka. The same limitations I heard also at a Delhi conference organized by ICWA few years ago when India was voting against Sri Lanka at the Human Rights Council. And the minister, uh, Salman Kurshid, he explained to the conference participant that how can a regional government dictate terms to the central government uh, and he is Basically, he, he explains saying that he is like Muhammad Ali, uh, the boxer, uh, allowing his opponent to punch him, but waiting for the right moment to strike him out. This is a, a clear example of how strong the Tamil Nadu factor in India-Sri Lanka relationship. Now, after 30 years, an Indian Prime Minister visited Sri Lanka uh, due to the leadership of President Maitripala Sirisena in March 2015. Uh, Prime Minister Modi is expected to visit the island this year. During his uh, last visit, he spoke about devolution and the need to go beyond the 13th Amendment to the Constitution of Sri Lanka. Now, this uh, we have to appreciate both the leaders' uh, effort of uh, working together. And this is, uh, there's a strong relationship between President Sirisena and Prime Minister Modi. In the Sri Lanka Accord, if you take it, uh, I mean, some of you uh, were here, I think, during that time uh, in Sri Lanka, and I met uh, an, a very interesting gentleman just uh, before the lecture. And uh, if you remember, in the Sri Lanka Accord, which was forcefully introduced according to the latest CIA declassified report, is a clear example of limitation of weak policy put forward due to pressure of certain political groups in India and Sri Lanka. In this regard, Sri Lankan government also failed to inquire and discuss with the general public of Sri Lanka 
before introducing it. This ad hoc approach created further tension between the two countries and within Sri Lanka's domestic political establishment. Now, a few days ago, Dr. Um, Jai Shankar, the Indian Foreign Secretary, met with members of the TNA, Tam Tamil National Alliance, and the Tamil Progressive Alliance. Now, Foreign Secretary was perhaps emphasizing on the unity of Tamil political leadership to fulfill the Tamil political aspiration. Now, there is um, there is an issue in here because there is, you don't see much unity among the Tamil uh, Tamilian parties, the political parties in Sri Lanka. Now, according to a Sri Lankan scholar Jehan Pereira, uh, I quote him, he says that India would be more likely to pressurize Sri Lanka on issues that concerns its own national security, such as the proposed economic deal with China in Hambantota, involving, involving the port, and Sri Lanka's uh, backtracking on the Indian economic presence in Trincomalee port, unquote. This pressure is created by two factors. First, India clearly not understanding the Sri Lankan view towards regional and extra-regional powers who are already playing an active role in the island. Second, by some speculative media articles which create much hype in both India and also Sri Lanka and deteriorate the relationship. Now, a few days ago, there was an article on the Indian ambulance services uh, which was provided to Sri Lanka, which is really appreciated by many Sri Lankans. But the media article said that it was a, um, a Trojan horse by raw. That was the headline. And I mentioned this to uh, a few of the scholars. And this is completely uh, a wrong. In, uh, this is, this is uh, the article basically explains that this is how the Sri Lankans see uh, this project. Completely um, speculative article. Now, with the equidistant foreign policy followed by Colombo, which is President Sirisena's foreign policy is balanced and Asia-centric, and he wants to follow an equidistant foreign policy. And India should not worry, uh, since Colombo will not pivot to one particular power, and this should not be the case in the future. Apart from India's worry of Colombo's pivot to Beijing, there are bilateral issues between India and Sri Lanka, such as the long-standing fisheries dispute, which is still unresolved and has to be resolved with a common solution that both countries could benefit. Now, uh, on the present day, if you take Prime Minister Modi's ACTIS policy, uh, has been extended from Lukey's policy to accommodate the regional cultural integration and neighborhood first policy also has to be appreciated because India should give its first priority to its neighbors, neighboring countries. Now, I have clearly stated the importance of this in the recent book, Modi Doctrine. From economic sense, South Asia has an economic value of around $2.5 trillion with untapped youth talent. There is much to be done to spur the growth of South Asia. Unfortunately, political establishments has failed miserably from independence. A clear indicator is the large poverty levels in Sri Lanka, about 27%, and India and also in many in the region. Now, however, India-Sri Lanka political anxieties persist due to the volatile geopolitics of the Indian Ocean. Understanding this is key to resolving many issues. It is vital to understand that China and India are two players with different strengths and weaknesses in the chessboard. The relationship that Sri Lanka shares with India is historical and social and cultural. Moreover, the location of Sri Lanka as one of her closest neighbors paves the way for India to share a bond that cannot be compared to many other relationships. Indo-Sri Lanka relationship should be further strengthened at all levels, including political, economic, social, cultural, and especially scholarly level between think tanks. Important inputs on policy making can be given by think tanks, which political establishment should be given the highest cons uh, consideration in both nations. If you even look for uh, joint papers between India and Sri Lanka scholars, there are only few um, for the, the last five years of the foreign policy think tank and also in here. I have not seen many, uh, but we should, we should try to provide many joint uh, scholarly papers of both countries. 
to strengthen any relationship, we should understand limitations and past errors. By better understanding the Indian notion, volatile geopolitical environment, we can orchestrate a better future for the next generation. Now, my final point is how to look at Sri Lanka as a stabilizer. Now, Sri, Lanka, Sri Lankan politics will be affected time to time by the geopolitics of the Indian notion due to its positioning closer to India and closer to maritime route. Now, balancing New Delhi, Washington, Beijing will be a priority for Sri Lankan foreign policy. Now, President Sirisena has clearly spelled out uh, his foreign policy, which is, I mentioned earlier, the balance Asia-centric policy with equidistance to all powers. It clearly um, has sort of, he's exercising it, and it has been very successful right now. Now, President Serisena has balanced it very clearly between the West and the rest. And the recent article that appeared on Forbes titled, I quote, China tells India to stay off its Indian Ocean colony, Sri Lanka, is a poor analysis, speculating that China is encircling India. These speculative news, which I mentioned earlier, so also, so these are, um, should be countered. And... Um, Professor Indra Disoisa rightly points out, I quote, Sri Lanka could potentially take a lead role in establishing a movement that demilitarizes and desecuritizes the Indian notion by building a regime for peaceful cooperation. Uh, this is a very important factor that Sri Lanka could actually play. In this way, we could build a peaceful region which will benefit Indo-Sri Lanka relationship. Thank you.